great and we went a little bit longer than we expected. We do have a change in the schedule. Um, I'm going to start my presentation right now. I'm just going to go right through it. Then Miriam's going to do her presentation and then we're going to have a short joint Q&A for both of us. Um, and then at two o'clock, we're going to have another break. You can go out and have coffee and a tea and a cookie and a muffin and whatever else you want. <laughs> and uh, we're going to come back at 2.15 for Sal and Elizabeth's presentation. And then our closing remarks and we're going to end at four. I'm super nervous. <laughs> Just gonna wait for it to be settled.
sounds like click or right click? Oh, you mean left click. Okay. I have a bio here. <laughs> so, hi everyone. Thank you for coming back for the afternoon. We really appreciate it. We were a bit worried when the room cleared out, but glad to see so many of you come back. My name is Debbie Wiseman. I'm the chair of Happy City. Um, I'm an anti-poverty activist, and I'm an advocate for things like food security, safe housing, accessibility, and public transit. Um, I did this survey because I know what my problems are with Metrobus, and I wanted to hear what other people's problems are with Metrobus. And we got a lot of responses, as you'll see, and a lot of varied responses, and a lot of things I, I didn't realize. So it's pretty great. Um, and I think this is a good starting point for us to um, do some research on Metrobus. Let me see. Uh -huh. It does work. Mm -hmm. I haven't done a PowerPoint in 20 years, so <laughs> have to bear with me. <laughs> uh, so today is actually Metrobus' 64th birthday. Um, they officially became Metrobus in 1971. Previously, they were the St. John's Transportation Commission. We currently have 40 buses, 19 routes, and 899 bus stops in our city. And here's the system map. And later you'll hear about some of these places that do not have a bus, um, like Southlands. So the survey itself, um, we had it out for about two months. We got 289 responses. We sent it out by social media, um, and we're still, expecting, or we're still accepting responses until June 30th, and then we're going to do some detailed reports on what we learned. Um, I said possible second survey, but we're definitely going to do a second survey based on the data that we have. And we also plan to do a GoBus survey, so a separate survey on accessible um, transportation within the city. So here are the results. Um, as you can, as you probably expect, most people were from within St. John's, Happy City St. John's tweeting it out. It's going to be a lot of people from St. John's responding. Um, we asked people, have you used Metrobus in the past year? And it was uh, pretty split evenly. Um, yes, 56%, no, 43%. This is a little flyer I found <laughs> in one of my research, which I thought was cute. So, for the people who said yes, they use Metrobus. Um, I was kind of surprised, actually, at how, how long some people have been using the bus. You see, more than 10 years is 42%. Five to 10 years, 12%. Um, less than one year is only 11%. Um, so I'm not, gonna, I'm not giving you guys like a quick, I'm just giving you a quick look at this stuff right now, but it's gonna be on our site later. Um, we asked people how many times per week do you ride the bus? And uh, it's split about halfway between less than once to four and then five plus. And then there's this little spot here where people don't ride it very often. Um, as you can expect with the service that we currently have, um, it's more of a weekday service than the Saturday and Sunday. Sunday's a pretty limited service in this city, so you're not gonna have a lot of people actually using it on a Sunday. And so we said, if you use the bus on a weekday, what times do you use it? And most people use it in the morning, obviously, in the afternoon. Evening is the lowest. Um, we do have some comments later about that as well. <laughs> um, if you use the bus on the weekend, what times do you use it? Evenings will be low because the bus doesn't really run on <laughs> and in the evenings all that often. Especially on Sundays, I think it stops at like 6.30 or something. Um, we ask people, how do you pay? Um, most people use the M card, and I think that's because the monthly card is so much money that you would have to use the bus fairly frequently to get a good value for your money. Um, so some people suggest that there should be something in between a 10 ride pass and a monthly pass that saves you a little bit of money. Um, we ask people, why do you use Metro Bus? Uh, most people said, do not own a car, and very, very impressed with better for the environment. How many people said that for a reason? Um, we asked what services and activities do you access with Metrobus? Work, shopping, and recreation were the top ones. Um, school and medical appointments also. 
uh, what would make you use Metro Bus more often? So you can see these are the typical complaints that people have with the bus service. You know, you, you want shorter travel times, you want more reliable service, you want more frequent service, um, increased service on Sundays, increased service on Saturdays, bus stops closer to home. And this is people who, as a reminder, are people who currently use the bus. This is their problems with it. Um, this question came out of um, something that came up around Christmas. And Happy City had talked about this before, and we talked about it this past year, about how there's no um, bus service on Christmas Day, New Year's Eve, or New Year's Day in the city. And we wanted to know if people would use it if we had it. And as you can see, an overwhelming majority of people would or maybe use it. Um, we asked how often is the bus on time. <laughs> um, one is never, <laughs> and five is always. So you can see most people, it's around the middle, but always, I don't know about that. I don't know what, I don't know what bus they're taking, but. <laughs> How satisfied are you with the cost? Uh, one, not at all, five, very satisfied. So it's about the same, you know, people think it's okay. <laughs> A lot of people were, um, wanted free bus service. I don't know if we'll ever see that, but it would be nice. Um, so how sad stories are you with Metro Bus overall? So one is not at all, and 10 is completely, and no response, no person didn't respond, but you can see people are again, like sixes and sevens are like the highest numbers. Um, we asked people if they needed any accommodations to use the bus, and most people said no. Um, so we're into the accessibility part, but I have some notes here. Um, so we also asked people, if you use the bus, what would make you use it even more often than you do? Uh, people said more accessible buses near my home, uh, bike racks on front of the buses all year, uh, more stops near my home, stops are too far away, 24-7 uh, airport run, uh, allowed dogs on buses, <laughs> a few people said that, um, more direct route to hubs like the malls and stuff instead of you having to go which somebody described as a uh, spaghetti route, and I love that, <laughs> spaghetti route. Um, and a lot of people mentioned that they dropped the mask mandate on the buses, and that doesn't make them feel safe to travel anymore. Um, and some of the complaints that people had, in addition to what I just said, um, were the long travel times, the length of time to get anywhere. Um, you know, it takes you an hour to get somewhere where you can use your car and get there and 10 minutes, um, lack of accessibility in general on the bus, lack of bus shelters around the city. Um, you have to, basically they have a, a, a rule within Metrobus that if you want a shelter at a bus stop, there has to be at least 25 people using that stop every day. And to me, it's kind of like a self-defeating prophecy because you go, nobody uses this stop because it's too windy or whatever, and you could use a bus shelter, but not enough people use the stop to put a bus shelter there. So they kind of like, you know, shoot themselves in the foot a lot, I think. Um, and of course, lack of snow clearing at stops, which lack of snow clearing everywhere, but at the stops. Um, we asked people what do they like about the bus. They said it's safer and cheaper than driving or parking, environmentally friendly, no stress regarding traffic. They can listen to podcasts and enjoy the scenery, and the drivers are friendly. And so now I'll move on to the accessibility part. Um, Metrobus has five wheelchair accessible bus routes. Um, so they just call these accessible bus routes, but they're not really accessible, they're wheelchair accessible. They're not accessible to a person with sight loss because you get on the bus and there's no um, audible signal of where you are. Anytime you're on the bus, you have to sit up next to the bus driver and say, hey, can you tell me when I'm at this stop? Or even if you're a newcomer to the city and you don't know the city, you don't know when to get off the bus. Whereas if there was an announcement, an automated announcement telling you which bus stop you're at, it would help a lot, but I don't think it would really cost a lot of money. Um, so we asked people, do you use the accessible routes? Um, of the few people who answered this. And yes and no. Well, it's only five and two, so <laughs> it's not really <laughs> a big sample source here. But do you use the Go bus? 
And so for the accessibility, we also had some questions um, we asked pe the people who did answer. Um, we asked them, is the bus accessible enough for you? And they, everybody said no. <laughs> so um, and some of the reasons were the bus is overcrowded. People are allowed to stand, so it's difficult for anybody with any kind of a mobility issue to get on and off the bus. The five buses that are accessible have a ramp that folds out, but the drivers don't always lower the ramp. And from my experience, I, I sometimes walk with a cane. Um, they don't always lower the um, step up either, even though they can. <laughs> um, they said hubs like the Avalon Mall is a nightmare if you're a manual wheelchair user because it's on this steep hill. And they moved it from the front of the mall over to here and they didn't even think like somebody who's using a manual wheelchair is gonna have a tough time getting up that steep hill. Um, so, and this was another one, is people who have to use electric wheelchairs have to place their wheelchairs facing the back of the bus. And so they can't see what stop they're at in order to signal to get off the bus. <laughs> um, and so of these five bus stop buses, um, I'm not sure how many stops there are in total, but there's 92 stops on those, for those five routes that are not accessible. So it, how is it an accessible bus, right? So next we talked to the non-Metro bus users. And we asked them, when was the last time you used the bus? Um, about half said one to five years, and uh, six to 10 years was 25%, 10 plus years was 20%. Only 4.7% of people who answered have never used the bus. And you will see the same kind of results we saw earlier that people who use the bus complain about. Um, they want shorter travel times, more reliable service, more frequent service. Um, this is things that would make them consider using the bus. And so we also had an other option here. And so some of those answers were um, bus routes coming from CBS or Portugal Cove or Torbay, um, more bus routes in Paradise and Mount Pearl, more bus shelters, um, more stops closer to my home, and Somebody said, I would take the bus, but it adds two hours to my commute every day. Um, I think that's, yes, that's the end of mine. And um, we asked people, like, do you have anything else to tell us? Um, somebody suggested an app for a bus pass instead of having to carry a physical card, which I have lost my card so many times. I would love to have an app. Um, a lot of people mentioned they really want to give up their cars, but the bus service is just not reliable enough. And a lot of people, again, mentioned in numerous places among this about the mask mandate being dropped. So we are going to hold the Q&A. Miriam's gonna do her presentation next, and then we're gonna have a joint Q&A. So thank you. Just so everyone knows, I had a drawing of my cat up here that kept me calm. And I barely had to look at it, so thank you all for being so friendly. share some results of our research in the Department of Geography. Uh, our research uh, is about uh, newcomers housing experiences and uh, yeah so. yeah but before starting I want to uh, acknowledge the land we gather together today at the ancestral homelands of Beatic while recognize and uh, respect uh, cultures and histories of Mi'kmaq, Biotic, Inuit, Inuit in this province. Um, oh, yeah. 
But the first question is why migration is crucial for mid-sized and small cities? And for your record, St. John's in a, is a mid-sized city, okay? Based on the definition, which is cities uh, which are um, have which have population um, between one uh, 100,000 and 1 million are considered mid-sized city, and less than 100,000, they are considered as small cities. But why migration is important? Of course, you may think about some uh, reasons like out migration, aging population, uh, poor economic standing, and of course, the population growth and every um, this kind of thing. So. I say economic and demographic challenges, and you see new releases for this province. We, we have serious uh, those uh, economic and demographic challenges, and migration is the kind of engine for uh, solving these challenges. Um, but what about St. John's? What we know? You might know St. John's geographically at the capital of this province, but um, you might not know um, St. John's, uh, unlike uh, many uh, capital cities, many, many provincial capitals, St. John's experienced a lower amount of migration, and um, which caused, yeah, very slowly population growth, and also a lack of diversity, which also rooted in the um, history of low level immigration from diverse racial backgrounds in this city, uh, leading to white Christian dominant population. And you see the census profile here for 2016. The population is around 200,000. And uh, based on the Stats, Stats Canada, uh, immigrants and non permanent residents, most of these groups are folks uh, from another country. The first group uh, have the permanent residency as a status and the second group have a temporary uh, a status and they are like 11,000 it's not that much and uh, you see the population grows from 2016 to 2021 which is only 2% and when you compare it with other cap um, provincial capitals like Halifax uh, in the same period Halifax experienced 9% of population growth but which is very <laughs> considerable uh, com compare uh, even in Atlantic Canada. So uh, majority of immigrants, uh, they decided to go to the larger urban centers, but, uh, uh, but among them who, can, who, ch uh, who chose to come to a small and mid-sized cities, uh, they still fail to retain, retain that immigrants here. So this is a challenge. So, both attraction and retention of immigrants in, um, in these cities. And housing is one of the challenges they experience uh, when they, they come here. Okay, mm, but um, uh, housing, uh, you know housing is essential need, of course, but is a main factor in newcomers' decision where to settle and then a uh, key determinant of their uh, satisfaction with life, social inclusion, and even justice. And when newcomers experience difficulties with lack of affordable, suitable, and adequate housing, they will say, okay, am I chosen a right place to live? So it's a, it's a, I think it's a very important question to ask. And uh, based on these issues, we launched uh, our research at the Department of Geography in ACESPIS lab, supervised by Dr. Violan Padisherman and Dr. Julia Christensen, my supervisors, and I'm part of this team. And we did, um, we launched actually a housing survey in last September, uh, which um, continued uh, fairly recently, mid-February 2022. And um, I also, because I will introduce why uh, I, I chose this category of immigrants, uh, international students. I did some follow-up interviews with them as well. And I will, today I will um, share some of the results of this research with you. Our main objectives was how newcomers experience housing. 
in Newfoundland and Labrador, and uh, how, how has COVID impacted these experiences and how we can address. But the, our participants' profile is one ADAD respondent <coughs> and uh, from 57 countries of origin. And uh, you see the overrepresentation of participants who live in St. John's metro area and uh, who came first to Canada as international students, which reflects the demographic concentration of immig immigrants in this province, uh, which is yeah, living in St. John's and around St. John's, or they are students. Um, based on these uh, results, I chose international students, folks, and I did some interviews with them. <coughs> but what are uh, our significant themes in this survey? One, newcomers are experiences are experiencing housing affordability crisis in this province, and um, uh, it's 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 uh, it's very un unaffordable market. And the second one is COVID nineteen has introduced some challenges like increase of cost of ut utility or loss of wages because of the COVID. So all of these financial things when intertwined with affordability crisis, it makes it very hard. And then housing market exclusion because of the discrimination, scams and traps. When you have a competitive uh, housing market, it really impacts the uh, increase of discrimination in this market. Okay. Here is other news release. Despite the negative economic standing after COVID, housing market is a different story. They experience, it experiences 7% increase, and 2020 was the strongest sales year over a decade. And it's very important. And uh, what I did, um, because uh, as I said, the uh, higher um, respondents rate, more, National students at Memorial University. I did 16 uh, in in person, uh, 12 in person interviews with St. John's students and four online ones with uh, students in Cornerbrook. And you see profile here. They were both undergrad and grad student. They were they were both live um, on campus and off campus. But it is good to know the situation of international students. I myself, I'm an international student. Uh, international students are a source of revenue for universities. And they also are human capitals when they come to Canada because the government, the IRCC, consider them as future high-skilled employers. And um, this, this is a migration system. They call it uh, immigration or something like this, which means education migration. Uh, which um, aiming at retention of international students in this country after graduation. And uh, the other challenge they, they, they have, uh, uh, because the first challenge is, which led to financial precarity, is they pay tuition fee more than Canadian students. Uh, but the other thing is temporary migration status, which is very hard, I can say, I can admit that. And uh, temporary migration status means you are excluded from some government um, help, like uh, international students are excluded from uh, government settlement services. They are excluded from some COVID, even COVID um, um, financial relief like CERB. Uh, and also um, you might heard about issues with MCP uh, extension, things like that. So. Uh, there are sometimes you feel, okay, you are treated as others in this system. So temporary migration status is a different story, which added to the uh, financial problem, you, which it is because of you, you pay more than other um, local students, and also uh, there are the possibility of racism and discrimination in this system. But what are the experiences of students? There are limitations of on-campus housing. You might ask, okay, how many beds do we have? Okay, we have something like 2,000 to 2,000 
and uh, 500 beds, but our enrollment is around 19,000. In St. John's campus, which is the main campus of Memorial University, the enrollment is something around 15,000 to 16,000. So it's a really limitation of on-campus spaces. When you add it to the unaffordability of, of campus spaces, uh, it, 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 it <coughs> makes a lot of problems. Like um, some international students, in search of more affordable options, they live in overcrowding situations in substandard living, uh, living space and also sometimes uh, not safe living spaces. And the last one is oh, general lack of small rental units. Many international students told me the, the, the option we have is most of them are basements. So there are not many small rental units, like one bedroom or two bedroom, which is another issue. Uh, we talked about accessibility today a lot. I just wanted to add Accessibility is another measure to address the housing challenges because when you have an accessible housing, uh, your housing is, is far better than other options. And for international students, um, we came to the point that cost and distance are two major factors when they decide to pick the housing. And um, cost, uh, I mean distance to university. And some international students decided to pick in between options, which means the housing which is affordable, but not too far from university. So it's very competitive market when you want to pick a housing which has both cost and distance factors. And uh, newcomers and international students experiencing transportation exclusion because they have limited access to personal mobility tools like license for position, like car ownership. Car ownership is actually out of reach for many newcomers. Um, and Bahar mentioned some of the challenges as well. Uh, for example, this is a direct quote from one international student. I do have the license from my country, but they don't accept the license here. Or the other person said, even though we're close to the bus, uh, the bus stop, the bus only comes every hour. So in search of affordable options, you ended up living unaccessible neighborhood, far from university, you have going through some challenges, how to access university, to services like gross groceries and everything. So uh, addressing um, transportation uh, is uh, very in effective measures to um, address the housing challenges as well. So it's very connected together. And lack of information. Housing information is something very new to newcomers and international students, and they experience some scams. Because when they are out of country, or when uh, after COVID, when they are in self-isolation, they are searching for housing options, um, mostly on social media, and sometimes <laughs> landlord roommates them. Even, I don't know, the agents, they send them some photos, beautiful ones, just fake ones, and they got in trouble because there's a lack of understanding around uh, legal aspects of housing contracts and issues with long-term contracts. And some international students told me they, um, the landlord or the agents, they refused to give, give back the security deposit to them and they didn't know what is the legal issue around it. So it's lack of information, housing information. And that nice photos, in reality, are, are these photos, which is <laughs> the house was full of trash. It was messy uh, in the kitchen, in the basement, and even more tens bags of trash on the street. And the landlord told the students, can you throw this trash away? And <laughs> it's the reality. And the student told me, okay, I was in self-isolation. Uh, we don't have, we want to live on the street after quarantine. We were at the hotel for 14 days. And uh, during the summer when the housing market was big and it was a very tough time for students because um, September 2021 was the first, uh, first uh, semester in person after the start of COVID-19 and 
it was what kind of housing challenges market for many students who they they wanted to come to Canada to Memorial and start a, their study, but they couldn't find uh, suitable housing here. And yeah, they pay the rent. They say, okay, it might be a good choice. And the landlord, they force them, okay, if you want this, you need to pay the deposit as soon as possible. Otherwise, you will lose your chance of having a, a kind of housing. So they didn't have any choice and they have to live on that messy situation for at least a while to get the sacred deposit back. And the discrimination is a very interesting quote from one international student. I filled more than 60 to 70 applications. I had to, I had an Excel file writing the addresses, the prices, the situation. It was tough. They're not really into renting their places to non-locals and students. Whenever they just rejected me after a while, I still see they just keep hosting their place. So I tried to contact them again, but most of them were still like, no, we're still searching for better applications. So it's, it's very, I think, <laughs> clear discrimination in the system because it's competitive, you know? And the landlords wanted to uh, pick better applicants. And then uh, another one said, I found out they were more interested when we were texting. But when we met, they were like, okay, we will contact you. I'll let you know. So it's discrimination based on nationality, your name, your skin color, your religious, everything. So it's a discriminatory housing market. And issues with reference requirements. So when you're a newcomer, you don't have any previous tenancy experiences to show. You don't have fina uh, financial status here. Uh, and there, there is lack of established um, social relations. And some international students told me, we asked our supervisors, our university staff like Bauer to be our reference. And it's hard. And the positive thing is there are some co-ethnicity, co uh, community who help with advice, with being your friends and all of these things. So when you're new, you don't know anything. You won't ask somebody to help you. And um, yeah, I, I myself, I was part of Iranian community here and they helped me a lot for everything, <laughs> including my housing. And yeah, the last <laughs> point I was, I wanted to say is housing is more than a roof overhead. And um, vulnerable population experience housing problems more than other population, including newcomers. And the COVID-19 has introduced even more challenges, including discrimination and exclusion from the housing market. Mm -hmm. And uh, housing situation affects newcomers' sense of belonging, and feeling at home, and the last quote here is, I hope in the long run, we will be able to say it's gonna be home. Thank you. So we're open to questions right now. Yes, so does anyone have any questions or comments for either one of us? And if you don't, that's fine, right? <laughs>
find it very hard to find a place. As it was mentioned, they say that it's okay when you are texting, but when you go for a viewing, it, you just, um, it don't respond back afterwards. So it's a real issue. And like at least like every month, we experience students who reach out and they experience homelessness. And as, per, as temporary residents, they don't have access to shelters. So they have nowhere to go. And it's just, uh, it's so frustrating. And, um, and if there are undergraduate students during the summer semester, they are not registered. So they cannot reach out to the university student support office. So they just come to the internationalization of it. And we have limited budget. But we try our best to help them, but still it's not enough. And um, another thing that was mentioned by students, and I've noticed many times that um, some property owners, they take advantage of the students, new students, uh, first because they cannot speak English like fluently, and second because they are not um, very well informed about the their legal rights as tenants. Um, uh, I attended, uh, I attended um, some hearing with the students, and first of all, it's not accessible at all. For COVID, it's over the phone, which is not accessible for many ESL people to talk over the phone. And, and one example, one landlord uh, asked a student to leave the, her property because she believed that um, she's doing business. And when I asked her what does she mean by business, she said that she's teaching online. And I was like, of course, she's a graduate student and part of her role in, in the PA. What do you mean? It's just like business. But she was like, oh, but she's getting paid. And the student was forced to leave the property at the end because of various reasons. She, she didn't want to deal with that. But yes, I, I just saw many stories like this, and it's just like it's unbelievable. Um, so Public Legal Information Association, we talk a lot. So they um, allocated uh, an email and a person who um, to run information session, provide like free consultation, but it's still students need more than that. And, and I look forward for more like recommendation and suggestion because now um, more students are coming for a spring semester because they will not avoid paying uh, tuition fees which has been waived for the fall semester. And there is no place for them. There are um, few grad Ukrainian students coming and we couldn't find a place for them. And so any suggestion or recommendation and I all have a listing um, submission. If you know anyone who have a free room or apartment or anything, feel free to submit it and we keep those lists for a student. Thank you. Thank you. Just to, I guess, this is more of a comment, I'm sorry, I'll probably lead up to a, something to discuss. I just, I think it's worth flagging that so far the university has not shown itself to be an ally on a lot of the things that we're talking about today, like institutionally, I don't right. mean like uh, the Hardier office or others, no, no, but I the university administration, like in my experience, has been actually pretty hostile to like uh, increasing housing options yeah. near campus or making the area around campus easier to move around if you're not in a car like these kind of things that would make their lives actually easier. Mm -hmm. uh, just, you know, it's it's not clear that they're on side here. I think it's probably worth flagging that as yeah. like a challenge in this conversation. Like I'm thinking about that development that is proposed and it will probably happen yeah. uh, for like a new student focused apartment next to campus. Right. And the university's response was basically that they didn't believe that students without cars didn't exist, that existed. So they said like, we can't let you build without parking because where will the students put their cars that they obviously own was, right. it was effectively their response. Yeah. And I was really shocked by that actually. Yeah. Uh, that like, because there's obviously data to show how many students 
can't drive because they're prohibited. Um, right. Yeah, anyways, it's just like maybe some, it's, it's an interesting dynamic here where like some of this that you folks are dealing with day to day has not like apparently made its way up to the administrative decision makers and they, they were worried that this new uh, student focused development would compete with their residents, which yeah. was a very strange dynamic to see written down. Uh, and yeah. they, they walked it back uh, to, to give them credit where, where credit's due. They walked that back after people noticed. But just like it was a good red flag that maybe there's some work to do with, with the like senior decision makers at the university to get them involved in like thinking yeah. about how do we get more housing built close to the school so that people can like, and so that people aren't stuck in basements and all this yeah. kind of stuff that you were talking to people about because it's yeah. true. There's hardly any options. It's it, like you look at other universities in Canada, they're often surrounded by really dense student apartment building, so there's nothing anywhere near Mon really. And, and my thought when I hear that is, um, how much of that goes on that we don't know about, right? Yeah. So the only reason why there was pushback on that and why Mon walked back their position was because it, it was shared on social media and people were saying, hey, wait a minute, what are you talking about? Residents are overflowing with people and there's no room for all these students, so like, how can you say that student residents take care of it? Go ahead. Yes. Um, I guess my, my comment is uh, sort of, uh, I was just seeing a thread throughout the day, like this morning when we were talking about, uh, uh, somebody commented about uh, uh, refugees being parked at a hotel up by the airport and the difficulty that they've had in, in being able to just get around the city. Um, and then we've heard about international students, you know, having to rent uh, accommodations far away from school and where, where they need to be. And survey about, about the, the bus, you know, the, the number one thing that people are asking for is uh, more frequency of service and uh, convenience. And so to, to me, a lot of this comes back to how, how we plan and build our city. Mm -hmm. And so I'm hoping that this, this uh, Metro bus survey that we've done and some of the other comments here today can feed into that the discussion that I think needs to always be happening really at the city um, to, to pressure them to build the kind of city that can actually support the kind of mobility that we've all been talking about here today, um, rather than this car dependent city that we're continuing to build. Yeah. And even though now and again you do see an example of, oh, we're going to build this great new building somewhere, we're sprawling way faster than we're actually doing anything like that, and that's not stopping it. Yeah. Um, so, uh, uh, you know, there, you mentioned the university is not really on board. Um, I'm like Metro bus. Do they ever go to municipal plan uh, hearings and say, well, you know, we, we could build a way better bus service if we had more density and mixed use. This is how it would work better. I've never seen that. I've never seen any engagement from Metrobus at the municipal planning level. Um, I'm also interested to note that on Friday, the federal government made a big affordable housing announcement, and they said Newfoundland Library of Housing is going to be building 31 new units. I guess it would help for someone to ask Newfoundland Library of Housing where are you going to build those units? Because yeah. that's a huge factor as to whether it's going to be actually helpful to people or not. So I just wanted to sort of tie you together some of those threads up here today and, and encourage the work that you're doing. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> yeah, the, the project is called, the project in your mind is called Work Live. And if you're in, in favor of it, you should let your city councilors know. Um, there is a little bit of pushback from some councilors um, about it because they're worried about the housing market in the area and that being affected. Like people who are renting out their basement apartments maybe won't be able to find a tenant so easily yeah. <laughs> if we get this affordable, wonderful housing project put through. <laughs> yeah. And the capacity is like, based on their proposal, it's like six. Yeah. It's not that much. So. Yeah. It's like tall buildings, like it's dense. It's it's wonderful. It's just such a great project. And yeah, the, the company like gives back to the community and stuff like that. So it's a really worthwhile project.
young man who I think is probably in the Middle East too, came to our door. I had never met him before, but he knocked on our door and he seemed to be quite desperate. And he said that he has um, been given an eviction notice. Now, I don't know anything about this person, but you know, he, he said that he'd been given an eviction notice for April 30th and that um, he had been trying everything find somewhere affordable to live and had not been able to find anywhere. He only had two weeks until he was going to be out on the street. And so he had resorted to going door to door around the city, asking people if they had a room or if they knew somebody who had a room because he had tried every other avenue and had not been able to find anywhere. Um, and I just wondered whether, given that he was evicted at the end of the semester or, or you know, the beginning of the sort of shoulder season to summer, whether either Airbnb and or homecoming might have had an impact. I don't know if I'd have been having sense of that. Yeah. But, but I've been thinking about him so often since I didn't have a room, but I felt so badly and almost felt like, you know, I don't know, it's, it's, it was very um, troubling. Actually, really yeah. Actually, Airbnb is one uh, example of commercialization of housing. Yeah. It's That's so. what I wondered. Someone wanted to rent his room out for the summer to. But yeah, yeah it, it definitely it has negative impacts on the long term housing, um, housing uh, resources we have. So it's a challenge. Of course, um, in, even this, this kind of projects, like the, they are private, private to that. And this also is an example of uh, commercialization of housing demand, which is very high in St. John. So I believe Airbnb and this kind of services, they, they have a negative impact on the housing demands in the long run. So, you know, the economy, and here we have, we have not good economy in this province. So many people can, they try to uh, make more profit up out of their property. So I, I believe it's, it's not good for the housing, in terms of housing, it's, it's definitely bad. And um, I don't know if you heard, but Bahar just said that you heard a few cases yeah. like that. Yeah, the one student reached out. She was staying at this apartment um, since 2019 and during the pandemic. And recently she was asked to leave because um, her landlord wants to Airbnb her place for the summer. And it was so mind blowing. So this person was there during the pandemic. Just Nobody was there to rent her place, and now she just kicked out and it was like it was more suited to uh, deal with the same situation. I guess the other one, but <laughs> <laughs> I know you're not going to. This is a question that I know you don't want to answer to, but I'm wondering does the city have any idea of how many Airbnbs there are with an So we kind of, I kind of like the beginning of the pandemic. There was somebody who wanted to do some work around that, but you know, with volunteer work, it's people come and go, and so yeah, I haven't heard anything about it recently.
Uh, also, uh, the map on that side, on that wall, uh, please like uh, put a sticker on uh, where you live, uh, so we will have like a more open concept. Uh, our neighbors, so we know each other, like where do those other people live, kind of thing. Um, please take your time to walk around the room. See, see you, I guess, around like a two turn, so we can start our last session.